This is Phil Barassa, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, one, two. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode eight of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host, Emily. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, narrative themes, comic book history, everything else of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Zeo Force, return him now! No, I think we'll just keep him bottled for a while. Or forever. Bring him back! You have to bring him back! And with that out of the way, let's hand it back to Emily Ford. Hello, Megan. The title for this week's episode is Triptych. The release date was January 18th, 2019. The in-episode dates are September 10th, September 12th, and September 25th through 26th, though not necessarily in that order. We'll get into (laughs) it. Uh, The writer for this week's episode was Peter David. The director was Mel Zwire. And as always, the voice director was Jamie Thomason. Uh, Special guest voice credits. We have a laundry list this week. Uh, Britt Barron uh, comes in as Livewire. Jeff Bennett is Abracadabra and Casey Kleba. I want to say is how that's pronounced. Uh, The star security officer who comes back again in later episodes. Daniela Babadia, I think is how that is. Daniela Babadia is the voice of Mist. Uh, Denise, do we ever figure out how to pronounce this? Bouet. I didn't figure out how to pronounce it. And if you also didn't voice figure of, out how to pronounce it. Okay, then. Sorry. Denise Bu, Boutte, maybe? Boutte is Rocket. Uh, Vic Chow is Dr. Moon. Um, the return of a uh, friend of the show, Cam Bowen, back as Tim Drake. Nick Chinland is Sportsmaster. Chad Lowe is back as Billy Batson slash Sazam, which I think, Emily pointed out, I didn't even think about it, uh, Billy Batson is not having to be voiced by a separate actor nope. anymore. I, know, I noticed that on like, the second time it. through. I was like, wait, that's Captain Marvel's <laughs> that's right. voice from Billy. Because he's, he's like, that's right. he's, old, he's enough. old enough now that he has one voice actor. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Maggie Q comes back as Wonder Woman. Uh, Dwight Schultz, which is a hilarious pick for Mad Hatter. Of course, Dwight Schultz from uh, as... Mad Murdoch from the A-Team and, uh, of course, from the Star Trek The Next Generation fame as well. Uh, Kelly Stables as Arrowette. Sorry, I'm going to take that again. Joel Sueto as Shade. Uh, and a uh, little side note, uh, Britt Barron and Daniela Bobadilla and Joel Sueto voice uh, three characters in Greg Weissman's Reign of Ghosts audio play, which I have not heard yet. And I really, really want to, uh, in which Baron voices uh, one of the titular characters. Um, Baba Dia is her best friend, and Sueto voices someone named Bernie Cohen. So if you're checking that out, does Britt Baron play the rain or the ghosts? I don't know. If exactly, she's one of the titular right? characters, titular characters, because <laughs> that's what that means. Ghosts. I don't know. I, that's true. But I don't know. I haven't read it yet or heard it yet. So I don't know. Rain of the ghosts. Maybe she's the. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, And then finally, we have a... Oh, no, not finally. Sorry, not even close to finally. James Arnold Taylor is here as Barry Allen in The Flash. Uh, Mae Whitman uh, is uh, here as Spoiler. She also plays Wonder Girl. If you're Wonder Girl... Oh, yeah, yeah, Spoiler and Wonder Wonder Girl's not in this episode, but it's the same voice actress. (laughs) Finally, absolutely no one voicing Orphan. 
Well played, Young Justice. <laughs> I'm glad, glad you're sticking to canon. Let's get on with the mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. So uh, we open this week's episode with Nightwing updating Oracle on his latest mission. We then flash back to seeing Mist, Livewire, and Shade infiltrating a Star Labs facility to steal an unknown but quite large and intimidating device thing. (laughs) We have no idea what it's for yet, but it's here. Uh, They nearly fail in their attempt, but Cheshire arrives to back them up. And the four escape thanks to Shade's dimension shifting powers, but not before Jade gets shot. Yes. <laughs> oh my girl, why? I'm here. I'm here to help. Bang! Yay, uh, Cheshire! Post-credits. Oh no, Cheshire! <laughs> no, that's, it was a roller coaster over like three seconds. Uh, Post credits. We cut to Jefferson and Jace in Jace's hotel room discussing why and how Jeff left the league when Nightwing calls. Jeff arrives at the car residence via Zeta Tube to meet with Artemis, Dick, Brion, Halo, and Forger. Dick and Artemis inform everyone that Cheshire has been located and may have info on the League of Shadows. We cut to a Detroit airfield where Dr. Moon is removing the bullet from Cheshire's shoulder. The villains try to escape by air, but Nightwing and his new team stops them. During the fight, Brion is trapped in a pocket shadow by Shade, so Halo becomes enraged and discovers a new power a blue-white light that's so intense, it literally sets Shade on fire <laughs> and frees Brion as Shade escapes. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> oh, Halo, honey. On fire. It's fine. Anyway. It's fine. Uh, it's all fine. At the same time all that's going on, uh, Artemis uh, gets into the jet and knocks out Dr. Moon and finds out that the shadows are being run out of Santa Prisca from Cheshire. Uh, Artemis then confronts Cheshire about being an absent mother to Leon. And after that whole sister sister heart to heart, Cheshire and Shade escape. And we then cut to Robin updating Batman about another mission. So much is going on. Next. <laughs> next up uh in that other mission we get a nice little flashback to it we have robin and his current squad of orphan spoiler and arrowette who have been following jervis tetch aka the mad hatter along the way they discover that the version of jervis tetch they've been following is actually clayface and spoiler tricks clayface into leading the team back to the real tetch who is in a warehouse experimenting on what appears to be a captured patient. Robin and his squad arrive and confront Clayface, discovering that Hatter has developed nanotech that duplicates the effects of the mind control chips we've seen used on metahuman teens before this. Mad Hatter then triggers a self-destruct button and blows up the warehouse with Clayface inside. (laughs) We then cut to a meeting between Aquaman, Miss Martian, and the holographic Wonder Woman, who is apparently still in space. Aquaman updates Wonder Woman on a third mission. The League discovers that Sportsmaster planned to free Brick, who we saw getting arrested by Bowhunter Security in a previous episode, uh, and an unknown metahuman. Aquaman, Flash, Captain Marvel, and Rocket foil the plot, at least partially. Brick is recaptured, but the unknown metahuman escapes with Sportsmaster. After all that, the camera then pulls back to reveal that all three teams that we've been seeing giving us flashbacks are actually in the same location, Gotham City, and we discover that Batman, Nightwing, Oracle, Aquaman, Miss Martian, and Wonder Woman are working together behind the backs of the rest of the League, the team, and the soon-to-be outsiders. (sighs) We find out that Stag Industries, owned by Simon Stag, has been capturing metahumans, controlling them with the nanotech that Tetch created, and then had Cheshire and Sportsmaster leading teams for the acquisition of resources. Batman and Robin use Tetch's control devices to free the metas controlled by him, while Superboy and Miss Martian arrest Stag for accepting stolen goods. We then find out that the device Cheshire and her team stole was apparently a metahuman failsafe left behind by the Reach from last season. Finally, we discover that Cheshire possessed one of Tetch's control devices and the unknown metahuman and the patient Tetch was experimenting on in the flashbacks 
or the same person, Shade, and that the three missions were told to us in reverse order. We also see Cheshire free Shade from Tetch's control in the same way that Batman and Robin had for Clayface. Finally, we see Shade infiltrate Stag's cell, and his fate is left a question. Uh, Back in Gotham, Wonder Woman voices her discomfort at the deception this group is participating in, attempting to avoid the limitations of the United Nations sanctions by working together in secret. All right. Whoo! I have. I still have a lot of questions. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> Let's do this. Aster, Aster, Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. <laughs> Why don't you start? So this this really is a you gotta pay attention to those timestamps kind of episode, isn't it? Mm, mm-hmm. And I and it's one of those things where I don't think anyone pays super close attention to the timestamps on their first viewing of any episode of Young Justice. Like, even if you're just kind of, you're just kind of vaguely aware of them, you're not keeping track of the math the first time through most of the time. Yep. So, And it took me like one or two tries before I realized it was like, oh, this is just in reverse order over two weeks. It's not that complicated, but it feels so much more complicated than that. Yeah, I have, I guess, yeah. Do you have thoughts? I have opinions about. I do. Well, you don't have to. Yeah, we can I move don't. On. <laughs> no, I'm. I guess, like, I'm intrigued by the idea. I I enjoyed the experiment. I'm not entirely sure if this needed to be told in that order. Like, I don't know if this was like they 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 could have written it in order gotten to the end and said, you know what this episode needs is to have these told in reverse order. I'd, and be like, wow, that's amazing. I, I don't know if it needed to be in reverse order. I mean, the reveal of the fact at the end that all three teams were together, that was pretty big as it was. Hearing you say that and thinking about it now through the way yeah, that yeah. we do. Please, I think part of it help me figure is, this out. The, I think part of the reason that they did it in reverse order was to keep that reveal that they are all working together more like less clear until the end because if you see this in the proper order how i'm thinking about it you can more easily track the fact that that's shade the entire time and if you know that it's shade the entire time it kind of connects (sighs) things a little more i i agree with you i definitely agree with you that if you knew it was shade but even in the flashbacks like if you leave the dialogue exactly the same it's just some random meta who's got really long hair with a beard and a mustache. And then it's a guy in a completely different outfit with a whole shaved head and shaved beard. And then it's shade with a mask on. So like, I'm not convinced necessarily as it's written. What? Shade's mask? Is that shade's mask? I thought that was shade's face. I'll be completely honest. Oh no, I think that's a, it's a mask that he casts shadows on the inside of the mask to blur out his eyes and stuff like that. That's, that's the way I. That's was. also super cool. I was just taking it super meta. I was like, what's the what's the most meta gene this could get on a person? Oh right, but his meta gene was already activated, right? So he was already a meta. Skastag wasn't creating metas; he was actually capturing metas that had already been arrested, right? See, you're you're right. And I did not, like, I apparently didn't process that piece of information despite how many times oh, right. I've seen this episode. Cause so right, because Hatter's, Hatter's experimenting on him, but he's experimenting with the nanites, right? Yep. Or not experimenting, he's just injecting him with yep. the nanites, no, you, right? You're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yeah. So I just don't know if it needed, I mean, like I said, it was a cute trick, but I'm not sure narratively it needed to be there or added anything to it because the underlying through line of that episode of the the reveal of the three working together worked beautifully as it was i still don't understand exactly why it's happening i still don't understand why oracle is being kept a secret from anyone else in the team you know i was reading some i was reading a website and i can't remember what it was but there was just a summary of the episode and it was like it's finally revealed why oracle's you know Oracle is a secret to the rest of the team. And I'm like, no, it, it doesn't. It doesn't explain any of that. I mean, there's... So McGann's there, but is Connor? No? What's happening? Because if Connor knew that Oracle was working, then why wasn't Oracle in at least Connor's heads-up display? Why? I mean, it still leaves... Why is Artemis and Jeff not know that Oracle... There's no reason. There's still no reason. 
unless Oracle just isn't a thing that has been introduced to anyone. You know, like I, I'm sure I'm, ho- I'm sure it'll get revealed and we'll find out why, I guess, in the future. But this episode does not, in fact, actually answer that question for me. If somebody else caught something or I missed something, by all means, shoot us a message. I would love to hear it. We'll throw it in a mid roll somewhere um, to explain it. But I still don't get it. Also, I'm real confused about McGann. Is she keeping secrets from Connor? Why was he not there? I, I don't know. I have some thoughts, but I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So anyway, that was a lot. Anyway, there's more stuff. You had some stuff about this Jace Jefferson interaction. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on this because we're in this we're in the point of let's share some stuff that we don't love, and then I will get into things. There are things I love about the ep- this episode. There are moments I love, but one of them that doesn't feel as strong to me as it could is this the scene between Jefferson and Jace that we do get in this episode. That's them in her bedroom having this conversation, and. Like Jefferson's dialogue in that scene informs his character and tells us that he's thinking about like why he left the league and everything. And it it doesn't yeah. add a lot because he does just come to the conclusion that he's already been at. He just questions himself for two seconds and then goes, no, right, I am where I need to be. And then we move on from it. And it feels like this setup for this scene could have been a lot stronger somewhere else. Like it doesn't feel like it informs their relationship beyond what was implied in the last episode because we saw them go into her room and shut the door and we fade to black and we're like okay we can all make some assumptions and move on and like it doesn't hit for me the way I feel like it could have and I'm not sure if it's because I as a viewer am not super invested in Jason Jefferson's relationship for whatever reason or what it is but I just I don't know it felt like it didn't do as much for the two of them, especially for both of them, as like a shared narrative as it could have. And I'm not sure how you could improve it, but it was just a thought on my mind every time I see this scene where I'm just like, huh, I don't know. I think, I guess, if I'm going to say anything about what this scene may do, yeah. is it shows her being, quote unquote, supportive of him. Yeah. Also, it also shows that he's sharing with her a lot of superhero stuff yeah, and stuff about the league that she doesn't like, like she, why, why are you doing this? Right. That's why it's here. Well, mm. Yeah. Oh, yep. So I can kind of get that, but I only came to that conclusion listening to you talk about the scene and let me think like, you know what? This scene does not do the same thing that a lot of scenes in young justice do. They don't do more than one thing. It's not a character development scene for Jeff. Like you said, I mean, you nailed it. And it's not a character development scene for her because we can't develop more character for her because I think there's something going on and we don't know more about her. We want to know more about her, but I don't know. There's so many mysteries around her and what this situation is. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, it is it is kind of a connecting casual scene in a relationship and, and showing like a bonding moment, but I'm, yeah that this is he's sharing stuff with her he trusts her with some stuff that maybe <sighs> yeah no that's a very that's a very good point that despite seeing this episode like seven times had never crossed my mind that this is information it didn't cross my mind until just now this is so, why we podcast that's right because i felt exactly the same way with the scene i was like okay well yeah we get some we get some it's not subtle <laughs> goodbye cartoon network we know what happened that was not an implied situation And it's kind of a moment there, but there wasn't much going on there. I wasn't quite sure what that was supposed to be. Anyway. Okay. You have a hashtag? You have a you have a classic Emily hashtag? I don't know. I I will it's it's because I'm a college student. Apparently we only communicate in hashtags. Every now and then I just put hashtags in our notes for no reason. So hashtag the fence metaphor. There's the whole scene where they (laughs) It's another t shirt. (laughs) Put it on a t shirt. Just a list of all of the nonsense hashtags I've made up on our show. (laughs) So for people who don't remember what this nonsense is, there's a moment when uh, Jefferson shows up to regroup with Nightwing and his team. He's like, where's Connor? And they're like, he's mending fences with McGann. And they just draw this out for a bit uh, as a joke. And it's, it's fun and cute. But this setup, like implies that they're off having date night kind of or something that they're talking about their feelings yay for them uh but seven viewings later i'm actually pretty sure that it's setting because of the reverse timeline 
they're actually off arresting Stag. And I, you blew my mind because I didn't read this beforehand and I, I read it as you were talking. <laughs> Your reveal was like, of course, that's what they were doing. And then I was like, wait, no, that couldn't work with the timeline. And now that I'm thinking about it. It absolutely works with the timeline. It absolutely works in the timeline because that I was, in, I was thinking that they had confronted Cheshire and her team immediately after they stole the device. But no, Shade had already said it was stressful to transport that thing. So they would have dropped it off a stag immediately. Yep. So yeah, uh, yeah. I think you're 100% right. And I like that. Wow. That's a thing that I like that after seven viewings, That's really I realized cool. that. And I was like, I was like mending what fences? They haven't, I mean, they've had some discussions, but they're figuring stuff out. Yeah. Like I haven't seen. They've yeah. touched on it a couple of times that superhero life's been getting in the way of nice, adorable dating superhero life. Yeah. But mending, mending fences and like, like Jeff was saying, like, I didn't know their fence was broken. Yeah. I'm like, neither did I. What's happening right now? Yeah. yeah. And, but like, I like, I like, that's. That makes sense to me. That's a nice little thing that they were able to do with the reverse timeline, I guess. You could. Yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not necessarily against the. Same. I just want to make it. it clear. I'm not. A, I'm not against the reverse timeline. I'm just not sure it added anything. Yeah. No, so. I know what you mean. I'm just. Yeah. I'm just joking around. Another moment I do. I really, really love in this that no one is surprised. I love Artemis and Cheshire talking to each other. It's so good, and it's the first time we've seen them yep. in a scene together this season. Uh, and it's the first time we've seen Cheshire in an episode, and I was so hyped. Murder Mom is here, uh, <laughs> and I love I love seeing that relationship that they've had for these two se- these for the past two seasons, and how that's evolved, and how they still have that really tense. We're on different sides of this superhero conflict, but they're still sisters, and they still care about each other, and it's so good. And I love the way. That it's, I think it's it's in the writing and in the acting that Cheshire is all prepped to be her usual like sassy self until she has like one moment to process what talking to Artemis lets her do, and she asks about Leon, and all yeah. of that just comes down, and it's so good, and like first time through the second Artemis walked into the room, I'm like y'all better bring up Leon, and then when Artemis's statement is go see your kid, I'm like I feel this in my soul, thank you. <laughs> Um, but, and they sum it up so well, they sum up what Cheshire is going through in her conflict so well when she's talking to Artemis and she just says, we both know she's better off without me. And when Artemis says, but you're her mom, she just says, yeah, but I'll always be Cheshire first. And I'm like, it's so good for informing where Jade is at as a character this season and setting up these issues she has with family and motherhood and domesticity. And it's so good to see that just dropping these seeds right here. And like, she has some soul searching to do. She has to like sit down and think about some things. I agree. Yeah. But I also love that again, watching it 10 million times, I love how much the show's, how much she actually trusts Roy. Because this scene could easily come off as like, I don't love my husband and I've abandoned my daughter. But this shows how much she actually does trust Roy because she's willing to give up Leon, the child that she protected with her life and left Roy to ensure had a good upbringing back in season two. And she has left that child with Roy to ensure that Leon has her best life. And I'm like, that means a lot about where Cheshire is as a character and where Roy is as a character. It does um, on another layer too, like, okay, so this just occurred to me. Yeah, go for it. So, I mean, Roy was messed up in season two. And uh, as we had mentioned, um, someone had asked Greg, like, oh, is, is, is Roy's being, being rough around the edges, like, because of his search for the original Roy, a parallel for the comics situation where he was a heroin addict and greg said yes also he was a heroin addict uh in the season in in the timeline in between so i mean clearly can't show will, that on cartoon network no clearly will is has got his his act together and has figured out and processed a lot of stuff this is true but it kind of says i don't know does it say something interesting about cheshire and that she feels like she is less of a good parent to leon than a former heroin addict You know what I mean? Like, I mean, not that people can't recover and move on. By all means, they can. Yeah. But she believes that Roy, as rough and messed up 
like psychologically Roy must have been at, at one point because of all of the revelations about him and who he is and that he didn't exist before a few years before and all that kind of stuff. It's a lot to process and he did not do it well. He went through a moment there. Went through a couple. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he, I mean, he's clearly recovered and, and done a great job with himself for his life, small business and loves his daughter and everything, which I think is fantastic. But does she see that? Is that what she, maybe she always saw that in him and just knew that the rest of this was him processing, which is possible. possible. You know what I mean? I don't know. There's a lot going on there. I kind of want to ask Dr. Letamendi back on and talk about, talk about that, you know? So he lost himself for a while and then he found himself again. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of you, Will. Yeah. We're proud of Will Harper and desperately hoping that Cheshire pulls herself together. Yeah. Oh, because she loves she loves Leon. Then that's clear in this scene, which I really yeah. appreciate. I like that they're framing her narrative as caring so much about her daughter that she felt she had to leave, not just I'm a villain, haha, leaving my daughter goodbye. Because that would have been boring. Yeah. But I, agree. I also on a on a lighter note, I do love that Artemis just kind of lets her sister waltz right out the door. <laughs> Because that's what Artemis does, and no one ever calls her on it. She's like, she radios Nightwing, and she's like, yeah, Ch- Cheshire and Shade escaped. So I'm like, honey. <laughs> we all I know. like how Shade shows up, and he doesn't even like a fighter or anything. He just like, hey, here's the door. He's just holding the door open. Basically, yeah. And Cheshire knows that she can just walk out, and Artemis isn't going to p- punch her sister just right. by stitches <laughs> from having a bullet removed. <laughs> right. I also, in this episode, I do really love the little Gotham kids team that we get. I want to see more of this team, the Capes and Cowles kids, uh, (laughs) Batman Incorporated Jr. They're an interesting group. (laughs) They're an interesting group, and they're an interesting group with a female majority, which we almost never see in superhero teams, which I like that it's not pointed out by the show. I also feel the need to point it out right here, and I like it, (laughs) and I like that Tim's a good leader. He's he's grown so much. And one of the things I noticed on multiple rewatches that I think is a really nice touch is that Spoiler and Tim don't finish each other's sentences, but they are clearly finishing each other's sentences in their head. They have a whole like back and forth where they are realizing that Clayface is that Tetch is Clayface where they yeah. don't say anything out loud. They just kind of say the first two sentences of a sentence and the other one's like, oh yeah, no, you're totally right. <laughs> and I'm like, that's so good. Like whatever their relationship status is or will be this season, they're clearly close and they both know how to process clues like the bat kids they are. And I like it. It's neat. It's a cool little touch. It's like the less, it's what happens when you have two bat kids in the same room. Robin doesn't just poof and just disappear. He just has conversations that no one else understands. Right. I love that spoiler too is the one who tricks Clayface. Yeah. It just seems yeah. really appropriate. I mean, there was a lot of character development here. And uh, you, you can even say that like, well, Arrowhead didn't do a whole lot in the scene. But actually, that was kind of a, a thing. Like... Yeah. Spoiler clearly knows what she's doing, and she tricks Clayface, which I think is real classic, classic Stephanie Brown. Uh, Orphan, who has no lines whatsoever, we got some real good character development for her. <laughs> like, did you know he was Clayface, or did you just murder him? And like, I love how the way when Tim realizes she's not around, just goes, "Where's Orphan?" Where's Orphan? Like she right. does this all the time, and Tim is tired. <laughs> Right. But also also uh with Arrowette, she she's new she's clearly new to this. Yeah, yeah. Right? And it's not that she's not good at what she does, it's that she's just not she just doesn't have the experience. And I think all of that comes across in these dynamics really well. And like she's she's the only one of that group who's not stationed in Gotham, isn't she? Arrowette? No, she was She's isn't she Star City? Isn't that where she Is that where we just we were thinking about well, I mean she grew up in Star City. That's what I mean. Like, was that because I think that was where we saw them and saw her in season one as a as a child. And I don't know if she's still there, but like if she's working with Green Arrow and being Green Arrow's sidekick. And I know we have Zeta tubes, but it could be an interesting touch that like Tim and Tim and Steph and Orphan all kind of know what's up with Gotham. And then you have her who's right. part of that team who's like, I don't live here. I don't know what you're dealing right. with. What do you I, mean? You just I haven't know fought that's, Clayface before. Right. You just know that's Clayface. Yeah. What are you talking about? Right. 
Right. Cause I mean, Tim's been doing this for years at this point. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. I like that idea. That was a possibility. Yeah. Anyway. And then we get to the end, uh, the almost end where we've got Cheshire, where we still like, <laughs> I wrote this note down and I'm still trying to remember exactly what I meant by it, where I was like, what is Cheshire's current employment right now? Who is she working with? Cause they just mentioned the, like, she and Sportsmaster didn't even know they were working together. I'm like, she's not part of the League of Shadows. She says that. Nope. She's not part yep. of the League of Shadows anymore. So what's she doing? Who is hiring this? Is she all, is she being an assassin all the time? What is she doing? That's a good question. But I mean, like, she was clearly, obviously, so she, she and Sportsmaster are both working for Stag, but just in different parts of working for Stag, right? Yeah. So Sportsmaster was in, what do they call it? Like acquisitions, I think. And she was in implementation. But it also made me think like, wait, so these other metas are under the mind control or nanotech control of Hatter. Does that mean Cheshire was? And then wasn't? I mean, she's not technically a meta, neither Sportsmaster, but is she just mercenary enough to get hired by Stag to lead these teams to steal a thing? Or maybe she, I mean, she seemed genuinely like she cared about the team. I, maybe yeah. it's just me, but she was like, they're like, you're here. <laughs> and he's, she's like, you're my team. And it wasn't until later that we find out that all three of them had been mind controlled. So it's not like she's cold enough to have let them just be expendable. I, I just don't know. Even if she was under the control of the nanotech, she had the controlling device at the end that she gave to shade. So she could have taken herself out of it, which would also explain why she let shade off the hook. Cause she didn't like being with those either, but I don't know. So I have no idea. Independent contractor? Why is she not with the league? Why is she and why are she and Raish not with the league, the League of Shadows anymore? Okay. There I actually kind of know the answer to this with Cheshire, possibly. Okay. Uh and it's about the video game. <laughs> Ooh, okay, great. Um, it's about the uh the red arrow journals in the video game that track red arrows timeline yeah the five-year time skip with some stuff uh which i haven't read yet yeah so and i will this is gonna be I'll, news i'll be diving into the more in the cheshroy super sweethearts when i get around <laughs> I to bet. that this summer i promise <laughs> it's a whole bullet point but one of the things i just mentioned in there is that for a brief time red arrow worked with cheshire with the league of shadows there is a point in roy's history over the course of five years what yep uh yep Yep, um, it's a lot to unpack, but they were both part of the League of Shadows, and then, if I'm remembering correctly, Cheshire breaks their cover to get him out of somewhere safely and, like, kind of bails on the League of Shadows to protect him, which is one of the first moments that Roy realizes that both of them actually kind of have feelings for each other that are actually genuine. So she wasn't even working for the League in Season 2, is that true? We never see her working with the League in season two. We do not see her working with the League. Whoa. I'm checking this my real mind. quick. I don't... Well, the only scenes we see her in is the scene where they find Roy, right? Yep. Wait, where is she in the rest of season two? I'm trying to replay the entirety of season two in my head right now. When her and Roy go save the original Roy. The original Roy. And that's the only episode she's in in season two, yeah? Here, I've, I've, I found it. I found it from the, from the journals because I was like, I want to make okay. sure that I'm right about this. Okay. In somewhere around team year four, Red Arrow's journal just says, uh, my cover's blown, Cheshire saved my life, and she had to betray the League of Shadows to do it. We barely escaped. Uh, which to me Whoa. implies that, you know, you betray the League of Shadows, you're probably getting kicked out of the League of Shadows. <laughs> Maybe that's why she doesn't want to be around the family. Maybe the League doesn't know that Leon exists. No, the League does. The League of Shadows? No, not the League of Shadows. Sorry, there's too many leagues in Young Justice. All right, so I don't so if the Shadows don't know that Leon exists, then Cheshire's not going to want to be around them. That is a good point. Uh, I think we might have slipped into Crash in the Mode territory, guys. Sorry about that, but I don't think it's major, it's more speculation. So explains a few things but also i'm trying to remember i guess artemis never does say like oh my sister works for the league of shadows we'll talk to her she just says we have a we we know someone who might know what's going on because i mean if if will and artemis are living in the same house you think he would have mentioned like oh by the way <laughs> your sister you know it doesn't work for the shadows anymore 
I don't know. Interesting. Okay. Yep. And so my my last two quick things, because we're still on this Cheshire thing real quick. I know we'd gone back and forth about this, and Neil was talking about it one time too. After doing a screenshot comparison between this episode and an episode from season two, uh, that room where Cheshire meets with Shade to unlock him from being mind controlled is definitely Roy's apartment. Roy's old apartment from season two. Unless every rundown apartment looks the same in Young Justice, that's the same apartment. Oh, nice. Uh, and I don't, I don't know what that means, but if we're talking about Roy and Cheshire, throwing it out there. But other than that, that's that's most of my stuff. What do you got? Well, you had asked me. You had asked me actually in the outline um, about uh, Wonder Woman makes this offhanded mention about the javelin, and they don't really explain necessarily what that is. But um, yeah, the javelin is the name of the spaceship that the League uses to travel long distances through space. But we haven't seen one here because John Stewart uses his ring to get them to the trial on Rimbor. So maybe they develop it later because they have to do space missions. But anyway, the Javelin, I think was, I don't think that was from the comics. I think it was originally uh, mentioned in the Justice League animated series. They used the Javelins a lot. There were actually multiple Javelins that that they used. So anyway, that's what that was all about. Montoya, Rene Montoya and Harvey Bullock appear to be in this episode arresting Simon Stagg at the end, which is actually quite cool. Of course, love conservation of DC characters. <laughs> They're like, hey, we're going to have cops arresting Stag. It's going to be Montoya and Bullock. Might as well be. Right? Might as well be. Why, and why I think Stag, I think cop when you have so exactly. many? <laughs> right. And I think Stag Industries is in Gotham because Stag is also responsible for Metamorpho's creation. That's a, that's a shtick. <laughs> so, and Metamorpho, I think, is based out of Gotham, which was part of the reasons why he was in the original Outsiders as well. We had mentioned this in the Scream Something about Dr. Moon. <laughs> <laughs> who is another DC like <laughs> deep pull. He was in the episode question authority, the justice league uh, unlimited episode question authority where he's the doctor that happens to be torturing the question that had the scenes, <laughs> the scene with questions, some of the best question lines in the whole series. Just go watch those <laughs> or listen to our scream something. We quote a few. You should go see it. It's a great episode. I loved the flash speaking at normal speed while everything around him was slowing down in slow motion, including Billy saying Shazam, which actually, it actually took me a, a couple of viewings to realize that's what was happening. Like what, what had happened? I think you brought it up. Did you bring it up in the scream? Something? I think I might have because you were like, yeah, and Billy just shout something. I was like, Billy shouts Shazam. <laughs> that's what it was. That's what it was. I was like, what? And then I saw the second time. And I'm like, he totally does say Shazam, right? It's in slow so motion, good. which was it's such a it's such a good gag. That was such a good gag. Absolutely. One of the things I loved about the episode. And Billy, of course, just the, just Billy. I just want more Billy. Let's see. Uh, Neil had a couple things, too. He had mentioned that Dr. Moon has ties directly to the Outsiders. I'm assuming he means in the comics yeah. that he helps confirm that Halo has no memories from before her death uh, in the comics, which I think is uh, interesting. He says the evolution of Halo's powers and Forger's amazing grasp on the English continue to be a constant source of awesome. <laughs> That's good. The Shell, com- Shell Company screen, tons of branch wood references through DC history including the in- invention of Zesty Cola Lakewood could be a nod to Mile High Comics location. Oh. There's a screen of all of the Shell corporations that Stag owns. Uh-huh. And I think what Neil's and trying to the- say in the notes is that there's a that a lot of them are references to other stuff from DC Comics. And Lakewood, what he's saying is Lakewood, th- there was, and I don't think they exist anymore, a classic comic uh, shop called Mile High Comics. And when I was a kid, it was one of the only like mail subscription services that you could that you could get. You could get your comics mailed to you. And of course, I grew up in a real small town in Kentucky, and so I'd see these ads in, in comics all the time about Mile High Comics, and that was uh, apparently they were in Lakewood. Anyway, but Stag, he was just mentioning that Stag is all over DC history. So if anybody else knows the other stuff that they show, like Antler Bay or Twelve Point or any of that stuff that's in there, like, and you recognize it, let us know. That'd be cool. I think Antler Bay and Twelve Point might just be puns on the name Stag, but we'll see. Wow. <laughs> Why? Why did I not see that? Why did I not see that Bedlam was an anagram for Delam? <laughs> that's how I feel right now. Uh, anyway, 
I'm feeling you there, Nightwing. Uh, and the last thing is Neil finds another 16. The transport truck that Barry and Billy are in is uh, SC SVP 16. <laughs> so he's our, he's our 16 man. All right, let's get, to, let's get to a short break, and then we'll come back for the Canary Debrief and uh, fan service and some Crash in the Mode. Let's do this. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. We have a new five-star review from Nefarious Honeybun. It may sound dramatic, but there was a time in my life where this podcast literally kept me alive. Hearing Rich, Caleb, Emily, and all the guests talk about this thing I love so much in a time I felt so alone was something I lived for week to week. I am so grateful to the YJ Files and wish I could convey how truly and deeply they have changed my life. Everything about this show is five stars, A+, plus, top shelf, and I love it, and I think you will too. Nefarious Honeybun, I speak for the entire team here when I say we're glad you're still with us, and thank you for these kind words. This year, Whelmed is proud to sponsor one of the private gaming rooms at this year's Big Bad Con in Walnut Creek, California. Big Bad Con is more than a gaming convention. It's become a transformative event that connects people and builds communities while ensuring that they hold space for gamers from marginalized groups around the world and amplifies their voices. If you enjoyed our discussion session with the amazing Dungeon Commander, please check out their fundraising effort, Babel on Equity Project, a fundraising event to bring marginalized gamers and designers from around the world to Big Bad Con. We'll have links to the Babylon Equity Project in the show notes, as well as to Big Bad Con's Kickstarter, which is happening right now. You, too, can contribute to the scholarship fund or sponsor a room in support of gamers everywhere. And finally, kind of a little bit of YJ news, Greg Weissman. Greg Weissman was kind enough to clarify a sticking point from an earlier episode that Emily and I had. Apparently, Lucas Carr rents out the room to McGann and Connor. So now we understand the car residence a little bit better. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. All right. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. So aside from the choice of storytelling vehicle, meaning the reverse order, the thing that I take away the most from this episode from a creative standpoint is the sympathy built for pretty much every villain in it. Clayface, Livewire, Mist, Shade, they're all horribly used by Stag, Sportsmaster for that matter, and Hatter. So Shade being freed by Cheshire at the end of the episode, it, it feels right to those of us who are coming to appreciate her and care about her. But the counterpoint of seeing that happening as a hero is voicing over, oh, she wouldn't do that unless it's for a you know good slash selfish reason, it helps to establish her continued reputation among many of the other heroes. She's breaking expectations and setting groundwork, potentially anyway, for our imagination, I should say, uh, for switching sides, so to speak, like that there's some goodness in here that she's trying to do something positive. Mist says numerous times in this, I don't want to do this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Telling us that she might not be the kind of person we thought she was. And of course, we don't find out she was mind controlled until later in the episode. Livewire is leaning hard into the villain role, which is classic Livewire. But the comment that she and Mist are minors and will be treated as such implies, I don't know, at least some attempts at rehab or not sure how much they were doing this because they wanted to. Uh, in, in Shade, like we don't know what happened with Stag technically. We assume that that was a revenge moment and it may well be. But my read of Cheshire is that she was truly trying to protect her team at the beginning when she gets shot and through the rest of this. So was she really planning to go ahead and do this? There's enough questions in here about her actions that are positive that makes me really interested to see where she's going. So when you're building antagonists, you can certainly have clear-cut villains like Sportsmaster and Hatter. Sometimes that's almost a relief to have someone that you just know is bad, right? <laughs> like this is a clear clear black and white villain thing. But even villains like Clayface uh, can be shown to have deeper personal motivations human feelings and drives and be open to change. And on the other side of that coin, I I have to point out that Tim and Bruce act as capital H heroes here. They could have used Hatter's control to make sure that Clayface stayed in jail. 
or even just stopped using his powers or whatever to keep him from doing what he was doing. But they didn't because doing so would dehumanize him. It treats him as the monster that others believe him to be instead of what a hero would do. So as real world as Young Justice gets, as grounded as it often feels in believable human emotion and motivation, DC superheroes, to me, have always been about heroism, about doing the right thing, not the easiest thing. So when you take the time to dive deep into the motivations of your characters, protagonist or antagonist, and find a morally or ethically sound solution to a problem that is challenging and difficult and not the easy route, instead of defaulting to the easiest but questionable solution, not only does it showcase the heroic aspects of your characters, but honestly, to me, it makes for better writing. So keep those things in mind. All right, let's do some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. So in fan service, we take time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. And we're back to Emily. (laughs) When in doubt, just ask me to go find something. So this week, we (laughs) have an artist who is all over the place, but I think we're including the link to his Instagram down in the show notes, uh, called Gabriel Piccolo, I believe is how you say his name, who does a bunch of art who is specifically, I think, Young Justice fans will like all of his casual Titans art. That's just all of the teen, the like the cartoon Teen Titans, but he's redesigned all of their like casual wear and just draws them like hanging out, going to diners, chilling <laughs> on a couch, and it's just all fun and really cool. He's also got some awesome Disney art and Spider Verse and a bunch of other stuff that people will probably like if they go check it out. His stuff also has like a ton of awesome detail. Like, it's real fun to dive into, like, he'll do, like, a whole group portrait, but then he'll be like, okay, wait, what's everybody's logos? What's, where's all the details in this? <laughs> like, his Starfire is almost always wearing a NASA t-shirt, which I think is so cute. I was going to say, as an old school um, Starfire Nightwing shipper, uh, there's one shot that's great with, uh, that's got Dick with a, uh, like, a Letterman's jacket with the the Robin R on it, and <laughs> Starfire sitting there with the NASA t-shirt on, and I just love it. Yes. It's great. There's there's some great stuff in there. Uh, we will throw out as a side note, bit of a bit of a not even a warning, but just be aware that this fan service there is some stuff. It's not nothing explicit, but there are some images that walk the walk the family friendly line a bit. Uh, none of them are YJ related. They're all original work by him that is also fantastically well drawn. It's just it just rides that line a little bit more than some of the other stuff. So just be aware. Just be aware of that going in. <laughs> But it's great. Check it out. Go go see Raven and Starfire just chilling at a house party or Starfire having to like patch Robin up after a mission and he's just a disaster. <laughs> nice. All right, let's let's crash the mode and wrap this up. Okay. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to the this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. These spoilers will be based on only the first 13 episodes, as that's all we've seen at this point. So if you are spoiler wary, this is your warning. There isn't a ton in this one. We talked about a few things. It's not really a spoiler, but it's kind of cool. Um, with the introduction of Orphan, yeah. Cassandra Kane, the Young Justice universe officially contains all the major canon Robins and all the major canon Batgirls. Yep. Or potential future Batgirls, which is which is fantastic. And like with that with that team, I I touched on it a little bit as a joke, but like in the comics, we know Spoiler and Robin do have a relationship, Spoiler and Tim, Steph and Tim. Yep. And we don't know where that's going. They're clearly close. They clearly got. Uh, they clearly have the same headspace. Sometimes we'll we'll see. We'll see. He's clearly having some problems with Wonder Girl this season. We don't know where that'll go. Yeah, those are all his fault. I I'm not I'm not <laughs> saying Tim did the right thing. I'm just saying. No. Yeah, it's a thing. My boy, boy Tim, my number two Robin. What are you doing? Tim's type is blondes voiced by May Whitman. By May Whitman, yeah. And he does not apparently have Dick's superpower, so I don't know. Boy. We'll see. Boy. Um, another thing to just to note is that Mist is the daughter of Star the of a Starman villain who is also called Mist. I don't know if that's going to come up or if she is in this 
timeline, but we have seen hints to Stargirl during this first pass of the season. If she ends up showing up, that would be really interesting. The anti-meta device? <laughs> like, we know this gets destroyed in the mid-season, but uh, is it the only one? Like, Neil was saying, oh, that reach device, it's just a, it's just a vague plot point, right? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Let's see what happens later it's, it won't be think, anything horribly painful it'll be fine no of course not it'll yeah. be a nice desk ornament <laughs> right uh, i mentioned it earlier too it's not a super like spoilery but simon stag is responsible for creating metamorpho uh, i think there was something involved stag's daughter as well i'm pretty sure you can see some of that origin story for metamorpho in um, batman the animated series so since we've gotten metamorpho at this point in the show uh, I don't know, maybe not this season, but maybe next season we might see if, if Stag wasn't murdered by Shade. <laughs> maybe we'll see Metamorpho Stag face off and get a little more Metamorpho as well, which would be really cool. That would be cool. Did you have anything, Emily? Anything uh, only other thing that I can think of is that Cheshire eventually does take Artemis's advice and goes and sees her daughter. Not Doesn't talk to her, but she sees her. <laughs> yeah. Cheshire. I just want to think that there's more, there's more to this shtick than... Like she's trying, like if we find out that she's been trying to protect Leon the whole time, I don't know. That would be, that would be a, that'd be a huge character arc. I I also like the character arc of it just being that Cheshire has some really ingrained problems with family because of life. (laughs) Because her family was a garbage fire. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Her her, her dad's piece of garbage. Yes. And on yes. that note, <laughs> on on that happy note, let's wrap this up. Head out of the watchtower before I go off on Sportsmaster as a dad. <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> thank you all for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. If that isn't enough, you can email us directly at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats over on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you're able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do more in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.